Video three of chapter three. Uh, we're still talking scatter plots here, but we're going to talk about something very specific about that scatter plot. Uh, in video two, we talked about the strength of a scatter plot, whether it was strong versus weak, and we said there were varying levels of strong. Technically, there are varying levels of weak, but in general, we'll call just weak weak. Um, but if there was only some way that we had a mathematical number for strength that we could uh, be more definite in what adverb we would choose for strong, like somewhat strong or very strong or extremely strong. Yeah, like these examples here. Remember, we talked about, I called this extremely, this very, fairly, somewhat. Uh, if there was only some number, that would work. So that's what we're going to talk about with this idea of correlation. Correlation is going to be a numerical value that will really tell us how strong, or really on the opposite hand, weak, um, our scatter plots are. So what we'll talk about today, how do we get this correlation value, uh, which is pretty much going to be in our calculator, which will be nice, uh, but then we'll, I'll show you some varying levels as well, like what I showed you with this, but on a much bigger scale. So here's the definition of correlation. It measures the strength, which is the main thing we're going to use it for, but it also technically measures direction of the linear relationship between two quantitative variables. Now, the directions is just going to be basically a byproduct. Uh, the strength is the main thing we're going to get out of this correlation number. But direction, uh, if the correlation is positive, then the direction's positive. Uh, if the correlation is negative, then the direction's negative. So we also get the sense of direction just by the sign, if it's positive versus negative. Now, correlation only measures the strength and direction of linear relationships, okay? So if we have a scatter plot that is clearly not linear, it's one of those curved examples that we talked about previously, then correlation really is not going to apply to that non-linear relationship. It only applies to linear relationships. So... Here again is where we have a strong linear. It is negative, uh, so the correlation value that we'll calculate will be negative. Uh, but since this is a linear relationship, I'm saying we can talk about correlation. Here is one of those uh, curved scatter plots, and since it's not linear, then we're not really going to be able to use the correlation number we get because it doesn't really match up to the scatter plot. So again, correlation can only be used for linear forms of scatter plots. Now, the mathematical symbol for correlation is going to be lowercase r, and here is this lovely formula for how you calculate r. Yeah, you guys want to calculate all? The, no, I didn't think so. Didn't think so. And uh, Kevin Hart down here, he's 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 thinking what you're all thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Now, before I continue on here, uh, there is part of the correlation formula that should look familiar to you if you remember chapter two. And that's these two little parts in here. Those two pieces represent something that, again, we discussed in chapter two. And that's when we had the individual values minus the mean divided by standard deviation. And these represent z-scores. So the formula for correlation, and I'll be honest with you, I am not very advanced in my statistical studies. But I don't understand why the product of the z-scores... And when you take the product of those z-scores for the x and the y, for the explanatory and the response variables, when you add up all those products of the z-scores and really divide it by the number of data points minus one, uh, how that really relates to a correlation value. Like, that's just kind of beyond the scope of what I know about statistics. All right, but this is the formula, which, again, we're not going to use. So don't worry too much about that. Now, how do we have our calculator do correlation? Uh, first, we have to do a little bit of um, preparation of your calculator. And again, this is only applying to the TI-83 and 84 calculator series. So what you're going to need to do first is we need to turn something on in your calculator. Why this is even something that's turned off, I have no idea. Uh, it's, I, if I ever meet someone from Texas Instruments, I would love to know the answer to this question. So we need to go turn on this certain thing. So you need to go to second, press your second button on your calculator, and zero, which takes us to the catalog. 
And what you can do is you can press the, the inverse button, which is this X to the negative one. So it takes us down into uh, the D of the catalog. And if you keep scrolling down, you should get to something called diagnostic on. So once you have got diagnostic on here with your arrow, press enter, and then you'll see it on your screen. It'll say diagnostic on, and then press enter again, and then it'll say done. And that has turned on the diagnostic. Again, why this is even an option, I don't really know. Will you ever turn off diagnostic? No, you really shouldn't. Do you ever have to turn diagnostic back on? Only if your calculator resets, like if you take out the batteries and it completely resets itself, or you manually reset your calculator, um, or for whatever reason you select diagnostic off, then you will have to turn on diagnostic on. So now that diagnostic is turned on, then you need to have data. So let's say I've got list one, list two, and I have this small data set here. So if you want to follow along, you could put these numbers into list one and list two. And we'll say list one is our explanatory variable and list two is our response variable. Okay. So once you've got that into your list in your calculator, then you're going to press the stat button, but you're going to move over to the calc feature. And then we're going to go down to option number eight, LinReg A plus BX. And one thing you might notice, I don't have it on the screen here, but number four, what's right above the quad reg, number four also says LinReg, but it says AX plus B. And there's really not that much difference between what number four and number eight does. It just switches what it considers A and B to be opposite things of each other. Uh, for whatever reason, we predominantly like to use in AP Stats um, this LinReg A plus BX. So I will always recommend choosing option number eight. Once you select that, and if you have a newer calculator, this is what you'll see. X list, that's going to be our explanatory. Y list is our response. So that kind of looks like when we set up a scatter plot earlier. Uh, and then if you leave frequency list, just leave it blank. Store regression equation, leave it blank for now and just go to calculate. And then it's going to do this. For right now, well here, let's go back just a smidge. We're going to get to this eventually, very, very soon in a future video. That's going to be the equation of the line of best fit for our data, but we're not officially there yet. R squared is something that we'll talk about at the end of this chapter. So again, we're not there yet, but it will give you R down here. Now you might be wondering, if you don't turn on diagnostic on, what does that prevent you from seeing? If you did not turn on the diagnostic on, so many ons, I know, then you wouldn't see the R squared or the R when you run the linreg command. You would only see this A and this B number. And for whatever reason, diagnostic on will allow you to see R and R squared. Okay? So now here's R. This is the correlation. Notice it's positive which means the direction of our scatter plot should be positive. Now, it also is 0 0.9986, and we haven't really talked about uh, bounds yet, so let's talk about that. The bounds of correlation, the most correlation could ever be, is either positive one or negative one. Okay, it can be one or negative one. The only time that it'll be one is if your data makes a perfect line there's no variation. Now, technically, if it's negative one, it also makes a perfect line. But it'll be a perfect line in a negative direction versus if it's positive one, it'll be a positive, or it'll be a perfect line going in a positive direction. So anything from negative one down to zero, but not including, will be a negative direction. Zero is really no direction. And if you remember what that scatter plot looked like, that's when we just had like, random points just like all over the place. That's zero correlation. There's basically no strength here. This is the weakest strength that you could have. And then anything from above zero up to including one, then we'll have positive direction. Now, here's a lovely picture that I found. Thank you, source. Um, for what negative one all the way up to positive one kind of looks like for a certain data set. So I'm not saying that all of these in the middle are going to look exactly like those. Like if you 
uh, ran the linreg command and you got a correlation of 0.2, this is what your scatter plot would look like. That's not true. This is just one of like infinitely many examples of what 0.2 might look like for a certain data set. But notice negative one, perfectly linear, and it's making a straight line in a negative direction. Positive one, perfect straight line, but with positive slope. And then you'll notice as it goes down, or really, I mean, kind of the correlation's increasing when you're going in this direction, but the points start to get more and more scattered and scattered and scattered. And again, here's that like 0.5. This, this is going to be that dividing line between strong and weak. And you notice kind of that football shape in there, or maybe that eyeball shape. Once it gets to be a little bit more than a football, like to me, this is way more looking than a football. Well, if I can draw, right? This looks more puffed out footballish than what I would expect, or a bigger of an eyeball than what I would expect. So if you start getting down into the negative 0.4s to really all the way up, I guess I should have stopped, to all the way up to positive 0.4, if you got any of these correlations between negative 0.4 uh, to positive 0.4, I would just call those generally weak correlations. Now, if it's really close to zero, then I, that would be like very weak correlation. Uh, if you want to call other things somewhat weak, you can, but it's really going to be the strong is what we typically describe more so with the adverbs. So again, this is ultimate strength, and then I would still call this like very strong, uh, this is still fairly strong, maybe moderately strong. Ooh, there's a new adverb, moderately. Uh, then we're starting to get in, in, getting into the maybe somewhat strongs for 0 0.6, 0 0.5. So this, I really love this picture. I'm so glad I found it eventually on the internets. Um, but this really gives you a good idea of what to expect from negative one all the way up to positive one, going by tenths, okay? Your correlation can be various levels. Like remember, the correlation back here was 0.9986. That's really, really close to one. So if you were to graph and look at a scatter plot of this data, you're going to see something that just about looks like a straight line because its correlation was nearly one. Now, some other info about correlation, the R value. You need to understand the correlation is technically unitless. So no matter what your two quantitative variables are, like maybe we're looking at uh, people's heights versus their weights, even though heights are going to be measured in probably inches and or feet, and weight is probably measured in pounds, the correlation between height and weight is just a number, okay? Your calculator doesn't know what the uh, two variables in your two lists represent. So when it gives you a number like that 0.9986, the correlation you would just say is 0.9986. That's it. There's no units to go with that. Uh, correlation is not resistant to outliers. So here I've got a nice uh, scatter plot here that's almost perfectly linear. Notice this correlation. It is very near positive one. But if I took one of those points, that point right there, and I decreased its y value, notice what happens to the correlation now. Like we went from nearly one to almost 0.7. Man, that really went from almost extremely perfect strength down to, I don't know, 0.7, what did we say? That was going to be like moderate strength or maybe somewhat. It really knocks it down. And the reason why it's not resistant to outliers is because if you think about chapter one when we talked about resistance, uh, we said the mean was not resistant to outliers. The medians were resistant to outliers. So if the means are not resistant... And here is the big O formula for correlation. Notice what's inside this formula, our means. And so since means are not resistant, then therefore so is correlation. Uh, correlation makes no distinction between your explanatory and response variables. So if I took my scatter plot and I said the explanatory is list one and the response is list two, and I made a scatter plot for it and I calculated correlation, this would be my correlation. But if instead I call list two the explanatory and I call list one the response variable, my scatter plot is slightly different looking. So I want you to realize here that these aren't the same exact scatter plots. They do vary slightly. Uh, but the one thing that doesn't change between them is the correlation. Now, why doesn't the correlation change? 
Well, again, look at the formula here. Here's the explanatory z-scores. Here are the response z-scores. Does it really matter the order that I multiply these z-scores? And the answer is no. Multiplication is commutative. It follows the commutative property. So I could move all these z-scores over here and move these scores over there. And in the end, it really doesn't make any difference. Okay? And then correlation is not affected by linear transformations to the explanatory or response or response variable data sets. So if I were looking at X versus Y, if I was looking at my explanatory versus response, or if I said, well, let me take my response variable and let me double all the numbers. Now you might notice here, you only see three of my data points here, and that would be these first three numbers. The other three are just kind of up off the graph. I would need to zoom nine and readjust my screen here. Or if I said, let's take my explanatory variable and look at a scatter plot when I add five to all my response variable values, then I get this scatter plot, which again looks different than these other two. But if I were to do the regression, the linear regression command, all three of these scatter plots all have the same correlation. They're all still 0.9986. So linear transformations don't affect it. Now, if you were to move one data point and move it, then yes, your correlation changes. So whenever we're talking about linear transformations, we're talking about to the entire data set, not to just one specific point. All right, so here I've got a very small data set here. It says reaction times were recorded for people of various ages involving a simple task. So we have ages in years and times in, I don't know, if this is a simple task, I would hope that these were in seconds and not minutes or hours or days or years. Oh my gosh, <sighs> not years. But I want you to do two things. Number one, calculate the correlation using your calculator. I don't expect you to use that crazy long formula that Kevin Hart would say, mm, no. And I want you to interpret the correlation's value in context. So think about what we said, what correlation represents, what it measures, and then you can tell me what that would represent to the specific problem. So this leads us to the end of video three, and I'm gonna leave you with one final question here. So, what can we do next with the correlation value? And so what we're gonna talk about in the next uh, couple of videos is this idea that the stronger the linear relationship, the stronger the correlation, the more useful the data is gonna be for making predictions about values that we don't have data for. So what I mean by that is, uh, if I went back here to this data set, okay? And we said this data set had a very strong correlation. Well, if, for instance, uh, if I could come up with an explanatory variable data point of 4.5, that's something I don't have a data value for, right? I don't know what its Y value would be for 4.5. But since this strength is really, really, really strong, I could use the idea that since this is a strong linear relationship, if I don't have a value for this particular X, I could use this X to figure out maybe what would be a very good guess for what the Y value would be for 4.5. So that's what we're going to talk about next, is starting to make some predictions. So let's see, again, you do this one, and then this is what's going to lead us off in our discussion in video four.